Dazzled the market and there goes the bell. So let's uh, kick it off then about uh, 40 to 45 points up. That's what we're getting at the open. At 18,400, it's a good opening, currently up close to about half a percent. But I think the level to track will be that 18,450 level. Today, for the markets, uh, we continue to tread higher. 18,400 on the Nifty currently. By saying the Nifty is hovering around 18,400, and that's exactly where it is. The Nifty Bank, for the second day running, it didn't participate. So that was under some pressure, as ending as flat as can be. The problem pocket, though, was the Nifty Financial Services Index, which played out uh, the expiry. That came off the high of the day. In fact, in the last one hour or so, that one moved into the red, and it came up close to around 100 points. You're watching us here on Markets Today, the show where we track about six hours of trade in five headlines. It was an interesting day for, the, where for most part of today's trading session. The Nifty was above that 18,400 mark until the last hour where we saw a big decline in all the indices led by the Nifty Bank and Nifty Financial Services. It was Nifty Financial Services weekly options expiry. A lot of options written at higher levels as a result of which we saw a big decline towards the end for the markets to end flattish and at the same time also confirm the fact that there has been resistance above that 18,400 mark. Let's talk about all those headlines then. Sensex and the Nifty end flat after a late sell-off wipes out intraday gains. Mid-caps outperform the blue chips. Tree Cement gains over a percent despite mixed results coming in the fourth quarter. Revenues and profits meet expectations but margins decline. PPCL gains a stellar on a stellar fourth quarter. Profits coming in at 6,400 crore rupees. Margins at 9% far exceeds trade expectations. Ashok Leland 2 reports a 17% fall in net profit on a year-on-year -year basis, but revenues rise nearly 33%. Crude prices flat, risk off, US debt default dampen sentiment, but a rise in the gasoline demand and supply cuts by OPEC lend some support. It's day one of 2,000 rupee note exchange window. No unusual rush or queues at banks across most metros. The Delhi High Court reserves its order on a plea challenging the exchange of notes without a requisition slip or identity proof. Let's tell you what we have lined up for you on the show. It's a packed show. In the market opinion, we have Ajay Srivastav, CEO of Dimension Corporate Financial Services. In Big Corporate Voices, we have Neeraj Akuri, who's MD of Sri Cement, as well as Banu Prasad Prakash Srivastav, who is the MD of BEL. Let's talk about the uh, straight... Uh, uh, let's go straight to the day's trading action then. A volatile day saw the market give up intraday gains in the last hour. The Nifty and the Sensex ended flat, but with a slight positive bias. The Nifty still below that 18,400 mark, below 18,348. The mid-caps outperformed with that index gaining over half a percent. Let's go across to Surabhi Upadhyay, who has all the details. Well, the day will classify as a slightly negative one uh, from the bull's perspective and that's because we almost gave up all of the day's gains uh, despite holding on to 18,400 for the better part of the session. Last 30 minutes, the bears really came in and uh, threw their weight around. The net result was a nifty almost falling into negative territory. Adjusted closing still gives us about a 30% or a 30-point up move, but it was really quite a bearish onslaught. So what was the problem area? IT and banks. Banks once again, the Bank Nifty almost ending negative. Adjusted close is just around the flat line, but the Bank Nifty was down uh, in that last 30-minute period. Uh, so on the on the IT side of the market, two stocks stood out, Tech Mahindra and HCL Tech. That's where the pressure was really quite uh, seriously apparent. And on the banking side, it was names like Kotak Mahindra Bank, Axis Bank, and even an HDFC Bank, where the pressure was very clear. On the other side, the green side of the screen was all about the Adani stocks all over again. So you had Adani Enterprises up another 12%, 13%. Some of the other names like Adani Wilmar, 10% higher, Total Gas, uh, Adani Transmission, 5% up on uh, those kind of stocks. Uh, the other nifty gainers included uh, Divi's, more follow through buying on good numbers, BPCL and UPL. Now on to the mid-caps. That was a good side of the market because the mid-cap index was consistently outperforming the nifty throughout the session, even in this last half-hour slide. And we have some interesting names. I mean, on the upside, key movers today include an MCX, Root Mobile, all strong result reactions, and even a Delta Corp had a good session for itself. On the downside, HEG and Borosil were very negative and very dramatic result reactions. Stocks down 6% to almost 10%. And NCC uh, was, was a bit of a curious case. I'm not sure if it has any links to Karnataka politics, but that was a stock that was on the way down. Globally, markets are now beginning to pay attention to the U.S. debt ceiling impasse. It's showing up in U.S. bond yields, and now it's starting to show up in equities as well. So we need to watch for those headlines very, very carefully as we come back in for trade tomorrow. 
All right, uh, we will monitor that, Surbhi. Thanks a lot for that. But uh, the Adani Group stocks, they were all on, under the spotlight today and they ended in the green for the third straight day. In fact, the group's overall market cap has now crossed 11 lakh crores. That's not all. Adani Ports actually has recouped all the stock loss losses that it had incurred since the Hindenburg report was published. Meanwhile, we had, uh, you know, according to Bloomberg's, uh, Bloomberg, Rajiv Jain's GQG Partners too has upped its stake in the group. Chen also is likely to participate in the conglomerate's future fundraising as a result of which we are seeing further uh, buying in the Adani Group stocks itself. The overall markets, uh, market cap of the company has risen more than 50% from the lows that we saw during the Hindenburg saga. Let's move on and get you some market opinion. Ajay Srivastava, who is the CEO of Dimensions Corporate Finance Services, says the investors need to be stock-specific in this market since there is going to be a significant divergence in the next six months. Also says valuations are elevated in the capital goods sector. If you need to be very stock specific in this market, because there's going to be wide divergence of performance as we come along in the next six to nine months. And I think that's where the trick is going to be that whether the sectors you have picked up perform versus sectors you've dropped out or the other way around. So I think it's clearly a choice between stocks it's not going to be market-driven rallies. It's going to be stock-driven performance of your portfolios. There are stories building up in the market. And as far as you just mentioned capital goods, I think it's a very good story. But if you're going to buy at these valuations, I think you're going to have very tough to make returns. They can be very good stories. Telecom is a great story. because Everybody uses telecom, right? But it never gave a return to the shareholders. If you're buying capital goods stocks, I think at these valuations, you may be disappointed at the end of the year that your returns may have been less than you know what you expected to be. But story is good, but buy carefully. Valuations are very elevated. You're talking of P's of 70s and 80s in a capital goods sector. All right, let's move on to the second headline now. Shri Cement reported a mixed set for the fourth quarter. The company reported a beat on the net profit margins coming in at over 4,700 crore rupees. This uh, versus expectations of 4,500 crore rupees. The net profit also came in higher than estimates of over 540 crores. Actually, there was the EBITDA which was higher than uh, the street estimates. Uh, Shri Cement's margins mixed expectations. Stock rallied over a percent today. Nigel D'Souza joins in with more. Nigel. Well, Shri Cement's number is a little lower than what we were working with, particularly on the EBITDA front. Now, the EBITDA number did miss our estimates by close to around 4%, and margins came in a little lower than 19%. We were forecasting a number of close to around 20%. The reason the profit number looks better, though, is because there was a tax credit in comparison to a tax expense. But the stock, well, it didn't uh, fall in trade. That's because the management commentary was fairly positive. Few factors that they said, they're looking at volume growth of around 12 to around 13%. Industry growth will be around 8%. So effectively, they'll grow at around one and a half times the industry, which is good news. They should end the year at around 35 to around 36 million tons. Next up, the EBITDA per ton. They didn't give us a fixed number, but they said the EBITDA per ton after improving in the last few quarters is still on a northward uh, trajectory. So that's good news as well. Moving to the premium sales as a percentage of their total sales mix. Well, it's only around 7%. They're saying by the end of this fiscal, it'll be close to around 14% or that's doubling it. And by 2026, it'll double even from there. So it could constitute close to around 30%. What's the benefit of this? They said in the near term itself, it could have an impact on the EBITDA per ton by around 40 to around 50 rupees per ton. On the growth aspect, they're saying that inorganic growth, well, they continue to look at something that's value added. We asked them spe uh, specifically on uh, Sanghi Industries, but they didn't comment specifically on this asset. Though they say their goal is to go to around 80 million tons by 2030 and that is purely organic. Well, on that note, let's hear out what the management had to tell me earlier today. We're growing in the range of 12 to 13 percent, uh, where our market growth outlook is about 7 to 8 percent, slightly ahead of the market growth, but largely because of new capacity additions that will come. Uh, with this growth, we should reach uh, somewhere around 35 to 36 million ton uh, uh, this year. On EBITDA, I think uh, we all know that there is a uh, there is a trend of softening of the fuel prices. Uh, that's a bit of a tailwind that we are uh, experiencing, uh, and therefore, uh, if everything remains uh, uh, stable, including the realizations, I believe uh, directionally we will be in a positive uh, positive zone. All right, let's move on to the third headline today. BPCL gained over a percent and a half on the back of a stellar set coming in from the fourth quarter. Net profits came in at over 6,400 crore rupees, which is almost double of what the street was anticipating. Revenues also beat street expectations. Sonal Butra joins in with a key number. Sonal. 
Well, yes, BPCL reported a good set of numbers in quarter four, and it was a refining lead beat, uh, like the other oil marketing companies as well. To take you through the numbers, uh, revenues declined 0.9% on a quarter on quarter basis, but they were higher than the poll. Similar is the story with the margins and EBITDA as well. EBITDA at 11,153 crore rupees, much higher than the poll, and margins also increased 600 basis points on a quarter on quarter basis, 200 basis points higher than the poll as well. Profits accordingly were higher at around 6,400 crore rupees versus a poll of 4,000 crore rupees. As I said, it was a refining lead beat, and that's why refining margins this time came at $21 per barrel, which compares with a CNBC TV18 poll of $12.5 per barrel. Uh, Jefferies, in its notes, says that they have a buy rating with 445 rupees per share as the target price. Uh, they say the next trigger for the stock would be the receipt of that uh, share they have in the 30,000 crore rupee capital subsidy that the government had announced, and the recent capex that they announced at the Bina refinery would actually leverage their balance sheet. So these are some important uh, trigger points going ahead for the stock. Investec has a hold rating, but they've increased the target price to 440, uh, uh, 375 versus 320 rupees per share earlier. They've also increased their FY24 and FY25 EPS estimates by 11 and 10%. Just quickly doing a pure comparison as well, BP sale in the refining segment has done the best this time around with the GRMs of $21 per barrel. This follows with IOC at $16 per barrel and HP sale has been the lowest at $14.5 per barrel. But quarter four generally for the oil marketing companies has been very strong led by the refining segment. Ashok Leland was under pressure ahead of its results in the fourth quarter. The car maker reportedly uh, reported a large, uh, largely in-line set of fourth quarter numbers. The net profits came in over 750 crores uh, and we had the street expectations of almost 620 crores. The revenues came in slightly lower than estimates. The margins at over 11% beat expectations. On a yearly comparison, Ashok Leland's margins have grown over 64% and the revenues have also increased by 33%. Let's move to a more earnings. BEL, Bharat Electronics, stumbled over 2% despite year-on-year -year increase in key numbers for the fourth quarter. Net profit grew over 19% at over 1,300 crore on a year-on-year -year basis. Margins also came in much higher compared to the same quarter last year. Vivek Ayer joins in with more. Vivek. Bharat Electronics delivered a stellar set of numbers as far as Q4 FY23 was concerned. At the end of FY23, the management managed to meet its guidance as far as its revenues, its order inflow, as well as its margin was concerned. At the end of nine months of FY23, it appeared to be a tall ask for BEL to go ahead and deliver on its stated guidance. However, a strong Q4 aided by strong order inflow as well as execution aided the company to go ahead and meet its management guidance. Uh, they joined us today on our channel where the company once again has given a strong guidance as far as FY24 is concerned in terms of order inflow, in terms of a strong revenue growth guidance of around 17% and a margin guidance of between 21 to 23%. Let's listen in to what the management had to tell us during our interaction earlier today. We met all the three, three guidance if you see that uh, revenue guidance, order booking and uh, margin also. So if you see uh, revenue, we were right on the target. Uh, so there was no issue in meeting the revenue guidance. As far as margins were concerned, yes, uh, by end of the Q3, uh, our EBITDA was around 20.5% and we were able to uh, reach our uh, guidance of 21-23%. We ended up with 23.35% of EBITDA. As far as order booking is concerned, I had always been telling that in uh, defense uh, order booking, it is not one day game. So we have been working for the last few years, uh, especially last year. So all they ended up in uh, uh, getting the order in the month of March. Punjab National Bank was buzzing on the back of a decent quarter. The asset quality for the bank improved. Loan growth also robust. Clocked a 475% jump in yearly profits for the company. Atul Kumar of Punjab National Bank says that the credit growth will be between 12 to 13 percent this year. Also expects the slippage ratio to be less than one and a half percent. Let's hear him out. As far as uh, credit growth is concerned, it was 12.67 percent. So we are setting a target for the next finance year between 12 to 13 percent. Regarding the NIM, it was 3.38 domestic and uh, 3. Uh, 08 for the global and we are giving the target for the 2.9 to 3 the region behind that because the entire deposit has not been reprised last year because there was an increase in the deposit at around more than 200 basis point which have not been reprised so this is the region but we will try to maintain the nai in the absolute number as far as the credit cost is concerned it was 
3.2.04 percent in the last year, and we are expecting it will be within the range of 8.5 to 1.75. It will be less than 7 percent by the end of the March 24, and our slippage will be uh, less than 1.5 percent. And we have the set the target recovery should be double than the addition. And the, as far as the net NPA is concerned, it is 2.72. It will be below 2% by the March 24. All right, let's take a short break. On the other side, we'll tell you all about the other headlines that we're tracking today. Yes, it's yes, okay yes, for yes, us to yes, nod yes, for yes. everything. Because we are parrots. Yes. But your wealth manager? Hmm. Shouldn't be doing that. You know? Choose Nuvama. We only do what's right for you and your money. Nuvama. Let's do it right. Film shoot. iPhone 14 Pro. Pe. Amazing camera, huh? And cut! Hang on, the director will send it. Beach, se, kaise? Those 4K videos are huge. Yaha juice to mil gaya. Wi Fi kaha se milega? Airtel 5G Plus to milega. So you've already got it. Maybe you should get it too. Back up, guys! Samsung Solve for Tomorrow is a national education and innovation competition. This is your chance to make an impact for India. Don't miss the opportunity to win prizes. So join the Samsung Solve for Tomorrow today. Z-Block Premium Agarbatti and Dhoop, official prayer partner, Delhi Capitals. We don't just make new categories, we remake legends. In fact, we make the whole world of India's mobility new forever. The last hour. Anything can happen between the bells. But what happens during the last hour is what matters the most. The biggest market swings. A close-up look at what's driving them. And how the investors are reacting. Watch the most seasoned market mavens guide you through the most important hour of the trading day. NSE Closing Bell. At these times, only on CNBC TV 18 and CNBC TV 18.com. Co powered by IBM. Well, let's uh, move away from the equity markets and speak about the commodities space today. Crude oil prices were flat as investor concerns over the risk of a U.S. debt default dampened risk appetite. However, a tighter market due to a seasonal rise in gasoline demand and supply cuts from OPEC plus producers lent some support. Manisha joins in with more on that. Well, yes, the crude oil price is on my radar where we have seen strength in the overnight markets and during the day-to-day -day as well. The much of the strength that crude is displaying comes in from the crude products because we have seen gains in heating oil. The gasoline prices are trading at a five-week highs. The U.S. gas demand is now at a 2021 highs because people have started moving out. There's more travel happening and that has been supportive. In contrast to that, there are supply concerns now emerging. When you look at China, we are looking at lower demand from there. It is about uh, OPEC and allies where... Uh, the latest JP Morgan report suggests that OPEC and Allies production has declined by 1.7 million barrels per day in the month of May until now and the OPEC and Allies will continue to cut until the month of December. Canada is an issue because the Alberta wildfires have led the decline by decline by 3% in the output in that region. Iraq also has seen a second straight month of decline in output here. And then there is a report from Vettol which says that Asia will lead the demand growth story in the second half of this year. And they're expecting 2 million barrels per day of a demand growth there. 2 million barrels per day of a demand growth is what IE also has said. So we are looking at support coming in from there. The only reason that you haven't seen the crude prices run up is because of the strength in US dollar index, the weak Chinese demand. Those are a couple of factors which are keeping the prices in check there. 
But when you look at the precious metal prices, we also have seen some decline come in here from the highs, from its all-time highs. The gold and silver prices both have declined quite sharply. And the markets do believe until the time you have the U.S. debt ceiling conversation going on, the strength in U.S. dollar index, the kind of layoffs that we are seeing, and the banking crisis concerns, gold and silver will be in favor. The strength in U.S. dollar can lead the prices another 4 to 5 percent on the weaker side, but these will continue to be accumulation levels. All right, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. Uh, let's move back to the stocks. And we did have a bunch of buzzing stocks. We, uh, you know, start with something like HEG, which tumbled nearly 6% on a weak quarter, where the gross margins for the company were down by 700 basis points. The margins for the company have been the lowest since 2021. In fact, we spoke with Manish Gulati, who is the executive director of the company. He says that he expects further softening in the margins as a result of which the stock ended virtually at the low point of trade with a 7% cut. Let's hear him out. See, between Q3 and Q4, there's a decline of uh, 3%. And as we are coming in this quarter, we are already speaking in, uh, let's say, uh, towards May end. We are uh, we are seeing further softening of, let's say, anywhere between 7 to 10% uh, in Q1 this year, April to June. And even going for, uh, forward, I mean, at least for next two quarters, I expect that uh, prices will continue to soften and margins uh, are going to be under pressure. We'll, we'll, we'll still make margins, but uh, probably not as much as this year. All right, from one buzzing stock on the way down, let's talk about a stock that moved higher today, MCX. That was the one that was about 5% higher, and this despite a weak fourth quarter. That's uh, because the company in its uh, conference call did say that they are committed to shifting to the vendor, and that is a big trigger for MCX as well. For other reasons, let's go across to Surbhi Sutalia. Surbhi. Thanks so much for that. So MCX had reported the earnings day before yesterday. It was a decent set of numbers. The revenue was down 7% sequentially. The operating profit was down 94% and that was largely due to higher software expenses, which has been an overhang for them for quite a while now. The margins have come in at 2% versus 23%, obviously because of higher software expenses. The management reiterated on the conference call yesterday post-market that the transition to the TCS platform will be done before 30th of June 2023. So that's a big positive. Investec has written on this and they have said they have a buy rating on the stock with a target price of 1780. They said that the options average daily uh, value was up 16% sequentially and futures declined 3% sequentially but overall operation performance was strong. They said that the continued traction in options volume and newly launched mini contracts will help their revenue growth going forward. And also for the first time, management sounded confident on the software transition, but that still remains a key monitorable for MCX. All right, uh, Borosil was another stock, uh, uh, stock that slipped over 8% on the back of weak numbers. If you just take a look at the company's overall performance, you know, the revenue as well, they jumped about 17.5%. The EBITDA actually declined by about a percent and as a result of which the margins of the company also fell by about 300 basis points. Importantly, the net profit fell by about 35% from 35 odd crore rupees to 22 crore rupees. If you just take a look at the internals, however, that indicated gross margin improvement from 65.5% to 69%. The reason why the margins fell were because of the other expenses increasing and the second was employee expenses increasing from 29 crores to 34 crores. And this perhaps was on account of uh, them increasing their capacity, their Opelware capacity has doubled and that started in Jan itself. So maybe higher utilizations from that is something that the street is awaiting. More importantly, they're also awaiting the demerger of both their scientific and consumer wear businesses, which are currently under regulatory approval. So this is something that we'll be watching out for. With that, let's talk about the fifth headline today, expecting some more disappointment coming in in the IT space. That's the word coming in from Mahesh Nandurkar, who's the head of research and managing director for India at Jeffrey, speaking to Prashant Nair. He bets on the banking story. Let's get in a uh, slice of that conversation. So the way to play the consumption story, according to me, is uh, through the staples uh, segment. And, uh, you know, obviously there are some, you know, financial companies as well that are leveraged to uh, retail consumption. Uh, I mean, again, broadly, the QSR space perhaps will fall in that uh, category. I think you have a couple of uh, QSR companies presenting. Devyani, I think, is presenting at your conference. Uh, do you like uh, those, that, that space as well? I think the QSR as a space, uh, you know, once again, uh, looks pretty attractive from a, a medium term or a long term perspective as well. 
uh, but I I just feel that you know maybe uh, you know that space uh, you know as a whole uh, will probably uh, still uh, need to uh, kind of you know go through a period of one or two quarters where the investor expectations uh, versus the actual delivery uh, you know get mitigated. So I would rather wait uh, for a couple of quarters. Uh, before jumping into the QSR uh, space here. You know, we've not, uh, Mahesh, spoken about banks and financial services, and you've got a plethora of companies presenting there as well. Uh, so what are the best uh, ideas uh, from, from that space? Uh, you know, I saw some of the smaller housing finance companies, very high growth, 30-40% growth, uh, uh, housing finance companies like Aptos, Home First, etc., which are going to be there. Where exactly will bulk of the money be made from here in the financial space? So in the financial space in general, so we quite like the banking story for sure. And I think, uh, you know, given the fact that uh, IT and banks are two of the largest uh, sectors uh, from the Indian market, both of them uh, add up to roughly 55 to 60 percent, uh, you know, of the index uh, benchmark. So it's very critical that you get that uh, IT versus banks call right. And our clear view is that we definitely have a preference for banks' financials, uh, you know, over IT. Uh, and uh, if, if you get that one call right, uh, then a large part of your uh, portfolio outperformance uh, can be can be kind of you know uh, 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 so it will be a big driver for you know your India portfolio performances. All right, let's uh, wrap up on this edition of Markets today. On that note, thank you so much for watching.